Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so, so much for your patience. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, let me introduce myself. My name is Rudranil Ghosh. I'm a journalist with, uh, you know, a national uh, newspaper in India. Uh, and, uh, you know, my interest uh, as part of my profession includes uh, foreign affairs, and I have been following uh, events in uh, Ukraine quite uh, closely. Uh, and uh, so why, let me begin with, uh, you know, why we are hosting uh, this roundtable today. Uh, well, there is no denying that this roundtable is happening at uh, an extraordinary uh, time. Uh, there are extraordinary circumstances uh, which, which have uh, provoked uh, this roundtable. The war in Ukraine has fundamentally changed the global order. I mean, and no country is immune uh, from uh, the effects of this war. Uh, millions of people, as we all know, are, are suffering in Ukraine. Uh, you know, the men, women, children uh, dying, uh, you know, not only due to the constant bombardment of an invading force, uh, but also uh, due to the genocidal policies uh, of an invading army uh, which targets civilian infrastructure in freezing cold temperatures. Yet, however, uh, particularly in South Asia, we know very little about Ukraine. Uh, you know, there is very little uh, connect uh, with Ukraine and uh, very little research being done on Ukraine in India and also in our uh, subcontinental uh, neighborhood. Uh, so it is precisely to address this information deficit and to provide the Ukrainian side of the story in these e extremely extraordinary circumstances that we are hosting this uh, round table. The round table, as you all know, is being uh, you know, uh, organized by the Ukrainian embassy. Uh, we have three partners uh, with us today who are partnering for this event. Uh, one of them is the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement an independent think tank which is undertaking research uh, and other activities related to uh, international relations, foreign policy and security studies conducive to the world and Nepal in particular. Then we have not one but two, two uh, institutes from Sri Lanka. Uh, the Center for Policy Alternatives, a non-partisan and non-governmental public policy center focusing on issues of governance and conflict transformation from a human rights perspective. And then we have the Rainbow Institute of Communication, Sri Lanka, uh, which is committed to train people in democratic value-centered communication. We also have for you today three fantastic speakers, you know, all experts in their own subject. Uh, we have Dr. Mridula Ghosh, who is based in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, her, her, uh, Dr. Ghosh teaches diplomacy and foreign policy at the National Institute of Kiev, uh, Mohila. Academy, one of the oldest educational institutions in Eastern Europe. 
and her topic is going to uh, or her topic for a presentation will is going to deal with post coloniality of ukraine and understanding the politics of memory in its history uh, focusing on language and the holodomor the man made great uh, famine of ukraine uh, between 1932 and 1933 then we are also joined with uh, are joined by uh, dr anastasia pilyovsky a russian speaking ukrainian born social anthropologist uh, she teaches anthropology and politics at the India Institute in King's College, London. Her topic is going to deal with Ukraine's and India's famines and the fall of the empires, particularly focusing on why uh, what is happening today is Ukraine's war of independence. And last but not the least, we'll be joined with uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Rohini Hensman, who is a writer and an independent scholar and activist who has written extensively on workers' rights, feminism, minority rights, and globalization. Her topic is going to deal with why has a large section of anti-imperialists not shown solidarity with the Ukrainians? So three very, very relevant and very exciting topics uh, to look forward to. And uh, without further ado, I would like to now invite uh, the charge d'affaire of, of uh, the Ukrainian uh, embassy, uh, uh, Mr. Ivan Konovalov, to give the opening re remarks and uh, get the event started. Mr. Konovalov. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Dear ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests, diplomats, I'm very delighted to see all of you here, as well as a representative of mass media, uh, scientific circles, both from Ukraine and our brotherly nations who are supporting our country so much. Uh, I expressed my uh, gratitude uh, to the speakers, moderator, thank you much, partner institutions from Nepal and Sri Lanka. Your involvement in this dialogue is priceless for us during this uh, difficult time. Uh, also would like to express my sincere gratitude to our sponsors uh, who made this event happen. Both companies, Ukrainian companies, Budma and New Age Beverages have Ukrainian roots and both are operating nowadays in Indian market. And we uh, also wish them a good luck uh, and in their endeavors and new achievement. Uh, I thank all and each of you for standing with Ukraine, uh, namely standing for freedom nowadays. Uh, freedom, this is a very important word, I think so, for all civilized world. But what is freedom? Uh, if we are in India, let me quote the uh, very famous, uh, very famous uh, person like poet Rabindranath Tagore. His poem, Freedom, directed to the people of India directly. Freedom for fear is freedom. I claim for you my motherland. Freedom for the burden of ages, bending your head, breaking your back, blinding your eyes to the beckoning, call of the future. And this is exactly what Ukrainians are standing for right now, uh, for together with all those nations which understand the value of freedom. Freedom is encrypted in the Ukrainian national emblem, uh, Trezup. I have it here on my heart. It is our emblem. In Ukrainian language, word freedom is vola. And one can read it one on the screen. The trident, the weapon of God Shiva as well, we're in India, we have to uh, respect and understand the culture of this country. And this spear has three prongs, which represent three powers, as well as three states. The three powers are will, knowledge, and action. These powers, when aligned, help us achieve our goals. Symbols are important for everybody, for all the countries and governments, because they convey the message without saying a word. 
uh, they convey the same information more precisely and in a brief. Why I'm saying this? Because I want you all to understand that freedom is something Ukraine and Ukrainian people will not give up ever. And I want you to understand that what is happening right now in Ukraine is not just a geopolitical battle between the West and Russia. Though many want to keep it that way. No, it's our fight for freedom. And this is a fight, common fight of the Brazilian nations for freedom and to make the new era to understand what does it mean, freedom. And today, while discovering Ukrainian history and further discussion, you will have more facts from our speakers, which will prove my words. You will see that this war has roots back in the history as well. Unfortunately, history is rotating. You may be for sure that every 50 years, we are lacking uh, evidence that it has happened, unfortunately. Once again, I want to express my gratitude to all of you who are coming, who are participating in this event. And if you are here today and joining online us or who are physically presented here in person, in this auditorium, it means you want to understand us Ukrainians much better. And we highly appreciate this. I wish you all to have a productive dialogue regarding the situation of Ukraine and our country. And definitely taking this opportunity, would like to congratulate all Indian people and all of you within the upcoming Republic Day. Thank you much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Konovalov. Uh, so uh, before we uh, uh, go to the speakers, uh, we'll be joining us uh, virtually. Uh, let me quickly explain uh, the structure of uh, today's program. So first, we'll have uh, the presentation by each of the speakers. Uh, following each uh, speaker's presentation, we will take uh, about two questions, one, uh, one uh, offline and one online. Uh, then at the end of the three speakers' uh, presentation, we are going to have a free-flowing uh, Q&A where uh, you know, we, we expect uh, a lively discussion on uh, the hot button uh, topics for the day. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, uh, tell you all that, uh, you know, there are more than uh, 22 embassies and 20 educational institutions from all across the world that have registered for this event. Uh, so those who are joining us online, I would request them to send in their questions throughout the program uh, in, in our Zoom chat. And uh, please also mention uh, your names and uh, where you're uh, located. This will really uh, add texture to our discussion. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let me uh, quickly go to our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Amritullah Ghosh. Is Dr. Ghosh online? Yes, I am. Right, right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, so your topic, uh, you know, post-coloniality of Ukraine and understanding the politics of memory in its history, focusing on uh, language and Holodomor, the man-made Great Famine of Ukraine. Uh, so they often say that to understand the present, you have to understand the past. So I give the floor to you, uh, Dr. Medulla. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. I need to now share the screen so that I have made a small presentation, which I would like all of you to look at. And uh, uh, just let me know if the... If you can see the screen. Yes, uh, yes, Dr. Ghosh, uh, we can we can uh, see your presentation. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, so uh, so to start with uh, today's discussion, I have made the topic like this. It's post-colonial Ukraine, uh, uh, but we would try to understand its history and politics of memory. Unfortunately, in one small round table consisting of a few hours, it's impossible to trace the history which spans uh, many, many uh, hundreds of years and which is impacting today. However, 
I think with my colleagues, uh, we will try to uh, reveal certain aspects. Uh, there will be several words and their adjectives which might be a bit unusual for Indians, for South Asians. Uh, but then before we go on to the discussion, I would like to mention nine undeniable truths that are true and it is impossible to deny them no matter what. Let me enumerate them without going into details. It's a, Ukraine is a sovereign democratic nation with an ancient history of statehood. It is impossible to deny this, no matter whoever tries to interpret it this way or another way. It is one of the largest states in the heart of Europe with internationally recognized borders since 1991. And of course, we cannot deny the high intellectual engineering and technological potential. People who are aware of even the USSR times know very well how much the USSR benefited from Ukrainian engineers, Ukrainian designers and Ukrainian uh, projects. They were extremely important. And there is no need to deny also the richest cultural, literary and artistic traditions. I would go into the details how they will have been marginalized, but let us now come also to that truth that this is a nation of great people. We have young people know the sportsmen and women, and we all know for the past almost one year, how the patriots and the defenders have to, are forced to defend their country. They didn't attack any country in history. Ukraine didn't attack and Ukraine was never aggressive. Nevertheless, Ukraine suffered a lot in the past. And as you know, Ukraine was in the forefront fighting Nazism and fascism. It bore the brunt of the attack of the, uh, of the Second World War together with Belarus. Every fifth person in Ukrainian died and every third in Belarus. So therefore, with Belarus, Ukraine had been one of the founding members of the United Nations, even though it was not an independent country. Now, let me jump to 1994. What happened in 1994? A memorandum was signed. It was called the Budapest Memorandum. These are facts which we cannot deny, which took off all the nuclear weapons from the hands of Ukraine, whatever was there within the framework of Soviet Union. Ukraine was the third largest. Uh, uh, it had the third largest arsenal of nuclear weapons and there had been certain missiles which were then transferred within this agreement to Russia and which are coming back to Ukraine and being hit today. We would not deny that Ukraine has been all this time since 1991 when it became independent in the late hours of the 20th century, that it has been a responsible member of the international community. We know very well the initiatives, you know, it didn't engage in any aggression, aggressive blocks and other stuff. So with these nine deniable truths, let me go forward to the understanding of the global South and Ukraine. Now, we have a very generic word, the global South. It is also something I may not personally like it that you know, we divide the world and then we just homogenize it in, in the very colonial way, like putting all countries in the same basket. But however, it's the reality that global South exists with its problems and with its understanding and the global north is something different from the global south. Now in the global south, the perception about Ukraine because Ukraine geographically is belonging to the northern part of the hemisphere. But however, in many points, Ukraine literally has more common with the global south. Now today's discussion, I would like to detail on that later. Uh, I would like to point out now that 
where does the roots of the problems in understanding Ukraine come from? First of all, it is a historical inertia. Ukraine belongs to that part of the world which was studied within the East European studies, Russian studies, Eurasian studies, you call it what it may, whatever. Uh, even in Western universities, I'm not talking only in the, in the South Asian universities, Ukraine is not studied as a particular country or even East Europe as a region. Might be, I may be wrong, there might be, there are thousands of institutions. I beg your pardon if I'm wrong, I'll be happy if I'm wrong, but Ukraine is underappreciated, undervalued. Sometimes even it is ignored and taken for granted. A very living example is that whenever I had traveled to India, Many people asked, oh, this is, uh, you came from Russia. I always tried to say, no, I'm from, I came back, came from Ukraine. Oh, what is that? Well, I started thinking, how should I explain? Then I said, you know, there is a country which has a big Black Sea coast and it lies between Poland and Russia. That is, okay, okay. Then people started nodding, but the inertia never really went away. You know, my problem was I felt very much challenged. Those were the days, maybe some 20 years back, but I felt that there is some, there is a problem. Ukraine has been treated always as just one of the countries that is part of a bigger, part of a bigger Russia, even, you know, what is happening today has deeper roots in this perception. And as a result of this, we find that in most of the institutions, we have the faculty, the thinkers, uh, the syllabuses are so designed as not to really focus on this country, on this region, the focus it deserves. <clears throat> and therefore we cannot talk about a balanced, a sound intellectual inquiry, which is necessary for you know, knowing the truth. And it is honestly, you know, science should not be based on propaganda and science should not be biased. But however, in public discourse and even in policy research institutions, I have often found since at least 2014, innumerable number of analytical papers and documents which shared narratives, which could not be verified by the authors themselves, let alone, you know, uh, to make an honest representation of facts. Because facts were distorted, interpretations were different, and uh, the, the lack of balance really was appalling. Now, one of the reasons that we need to engage with is the young intellectuals who should really, really think that a rethinking is needed. Now, in this, we have two challenges, in fact. You know, the first challenge is that, you know, there is nothing that I am doing today is against Russia per se, because you know, Russia is a big country. Russia has enormous resources. Russia has enormous strength. You know, it is not something that I'm challenging. This is not my purpose. My purpose is that there has been a very expansionist media and Russia has soft power, which it uses against Ukraine. It can use its soft power to ex extend its influence that every country does. It has no problem with it. It has great literature, great everything. But however I would talk about it, it looks like a grand bulldozer. You know, it just pushes away everything on its way. It just rejects. So the very fact of this problem is, uh, is so huge that we find in this big information mayhem that we have today with the social media, with you know, Twitter, with, uh, with the bots and all these other things that in the post-truth era, as we say, that uh, there is a huge massive of information and you have, it is quantified and it is, multiplied so you have the feeling that it attains the status of truth but however we have to look deep uh, look deeper and analyze these and this is a very daunting task i would not say much as my the moderator himself said about the wartime extremities i am sitting and talking to you from kiev 
the capital. I'm in the hall of the university, uh, which is the oldest, one of the oldest in Kiev. That is, it was established in 1615. And I am sitting under air alert now. We have an air alert that, you know, planes have flown and, you know, there may be missile attack, etc. So it is becoming an everyday matter for us. Now, these wartime extremities, life is going on. People are resilient. I, I need you to remember this. And of course, the huge humanitarian crisis. Why did I come over here? Because, you know, the electricity problems have emerged due to the uh, missile attacks on civil infrastructure. So we have regular power cuts. So I could talk uninterrupted with you. I'm sitting here. Now, let me move away from uh, myself to another small little aspect that is we have the global south, okay? And why are we talking of dialogue and why now? You know, we have to explain again, I'm repeating, is that the Ukraine's common values and legacies, what are they? I'm going to explain it. And the second is, it is time and it has already happened. Thank God nobody would ever say to me that I'm in Russia today. Everybody knows and everybody calls me, is expressing their sympathies and you know they are always asking me, how are you doing? So everybody knows where is Ukraine. So Ukraine has been, thank God, pushed from the periphery to the center of attention. So this was long needed. It, it, is a, it was a long awaited, unfortunately, the war, the tragic war brought it to the forefront of the civilized world. <clears throat> and now today, what we need to do is to invest in people to people contacts. The leadership of Ukraine, starting from the president, the minister of foreign affairs, and all people in the, in the, in the, among the authorities, they agree that people to people contacts with the global south together with you know the diplomatic dialogue and other things are important because the global south has been ukraine had been on the periphery and the global south also so this 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 is something that we need to also start and here i think the ukrainian embassy's initiative to start this dialogue in delhi encompassing all the you know south asian countries is extremely important uh, if you have questions, please write to them, I will explain. But now I would go a little bit deeper into the sources of Ukraine's post-coloniality. This might amuse some people who would expect that what kind of post-coloniality are you speaking about? Ukraine was never a colony really, because of the, in the traditional sense, you think that a colony is essentially the typical colony of the Western powers in Asia, Africa and Latin America. It was never a traditional colony. The colonialism we are talking about is something very different. And I believe that post-colonial scholars will be studying it. And it's a phenomenon which had been you know, overlooked, neglected, or even I would say untreated. And it existed like, you know, like a pristine, you know, it, it, it still exists. The dominant and subaltern, like the colonizers and the, those who are colonized, they differed, you know, not racially. And, you know, it was a different differentiation. It was cultural and it was linguistic. And therefore, you know, there were Ukrainians, you may say, oh, well, this is something wrong because a lot of Ukrainians made brilliant careers in during the Soviet times. They were in Soviet leadership. They were quite successful people. And even today they have, they are living in different parts of Russia. Yes, it is true. The marginalization for Ukrainians was collective, not individual. The individuals who could rise and make careers were those who accepted the assimilative aspects of overall dominant Russian culture and acquiesced with it, you know. So therefore, the, the danger that Ukraine posed was of a collective national awareness. That was what was uh, something different. And in this, you know, Russia's role was somewhat mystified because this is what we call about the white man's burden. You know, the, the, the post-colonial scholars have 
understood that they have a certain mission of you know a patronizing some kind of you know helping and getting people civilized so this is even this as russia's mission because of the big you know so it had mystified itself to carrying out certain spiritual tasks you know juxtaposing itself from the western mercantilizing so this was something very appealing to many scholars who treated that this 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 is the root of the anti imperialist kind of a role that after the you know after the revolution of 1917 that the rhetoric of you know russia and the later ussr happened so today we have like in the later stages of the 20th century when the soviet union collapsed and we had the independent states even and before that it was like the imperial narrative versus the counter narrative which was having some national sentiments national sentiments was always you know marginalized and ukraine was called little russia you know this kind of a role of a bigger power you know like a canopy uh, it is like the belarus little russia and the great russia this was the trio the trio triune uh, dominating the political sphere and the intellectual uh, sphere so it made a very subtle and um, you know a, a kind of a campaign i should say that the others the other had less agency and that the other really do not have that strength they do not have the strength they are lesser so the real ukraine that is was like in 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 before you know it was like always a threat the threat was the ukrainian identity this and therefore the portrayal was quite ambivalent it was the portrayal uh, sometimes you will see in gogol's writings in others writings i would not spend a lot of time because if we talk about literature we need 2 3 hours to discuss it's so rich and so interesting debate uh, you might find ukrainian elements but those are treated as you know aesthetic they will never challenge the political that this is this is nothing to do with the political imperial narrative which is overarching so therefore you know over time what evolved was the ukrainian national awareness was branded as like the soviets after the revolution they always looked at it as bourgeois nationalism and ukrainian bourgeois nationalism in fact was a clause which was uh, you know accused of a lot of dissidents suffered jail sentences because of their writings because of their you know awareness i would not talk only about shevchenko who was in tsarist uh, prison for many years sent uh, sent to kazakhstan on exile uh, later on whenever this phenomenon in the west of ukraine shaped in a different way and there were people who were fighting uh, even with arms in their hands so they were branded as fascist or nazi why because you know the stepan bandera is a figure which you will hear from the you know from different you know sources he is treated as the top fascist or a nazi person but however i would just intrigue you by telling that he has followed very similar roads of what netaji shubhash bosh did in our indian freedom movement he he asked for help but again he was arrested and he suffered prison sentences in a german prison so he was not liked by the nazis either so these are things that need to be studied i would also say that in view of all this today there is a rising you know tendency of questioning the existence of the ukrainian nation and the state and ukrainian nation i don't mean the ethnic ukrainians only i mean the political nation which consists of many other nationalities crimean tatars in particular as the indigenous people of crimea and we have my colleague will uh, dr hensman will detail on it in a much better way than i am doing so what we had had in the past was systematic arrests deportations and persecution are being continued today in the occupied territories this is very very serious to consider and i think that 
not just for scholarly discussion, but for reflection on the humanitarian law and the human rights aspects also. Uh, you know, as I said, I repeat that the idea is that the Ukrainians are unable to do something good, you know, because they are weak, they are not worth. So therefore it cannot be better than Russia. Um, I have a friend who's a scholar, Mikola Ryabchuk, he's a very, very famous post-colonial scholar who said that it is like the Russian Robinson Crusoe and the Ukrainian Friday. Friday is good as long as Friday follows the uh, orders of Robinson, but Friday cannot be the equal to Robinson Crusoe. You know, this is very, very important. So you cannot have the equal status. You will always be a bit less, you know. So this marginalization. And therefore, what we have is Ukrainians, no, they cannot build democracy and they cannot fight because, you know, it is all NATO, it is all the West. So they are only West proxy. They cannot be independent. However, this is grossly wrong. And this is absolutely, uh, I would say, uh, unscientific because it has no basis. Because on the ground, the ground reality reflects something different. I would go into focus my attention on two aspects now. Uh, if I'm running out of time, just let me know. <clears throat> Ukrainian language is lightly discriminated. You know, we do not have the racial differences. You know, I told you that the, uh, the, the difference had been cultural and rather linguistic, uh, this colonizing, you know, element. So uh, I would say like, you have the black skin was the colonizing element. It's a very serious element. So in this sense, somewhat Ukrainian language has become the black skin here. It was like it suffered 60 prohibitions in during the 337 years of foreign rule over Ukraine. Yes, it suffered prohibitions not only from Russia, it also suffered prohibitions during the Austro-Hungarian Empire by Austria. It also suffered um, prohibition from Poland when Western Ukraine was under Poland. However, today, uh, the ban came from different sources, like it was banned by the church, Tsarist authorities banned it in official use, education, and in print everywhere. So this a priori, if you're rejecting a language, and this is extremely important because the Valuev uh, orders in 1863 and Ems order of Alexander II in 1876 were the most notorious ones because they even mentioned that there is nothing called the Ukrainian language. It is a dialect. It, did, it doesn't have the full status. But trust me, I have been going deep into Ukrainian literature without having the opportunity to learn the language, but I learned it myself. And I have a lot of friends and professors who help me. So I should tell you that it is the richest literature that I come across. And um, maybe, you know, the, the Gosh, other point, uh... Dr. Yeah. Ghosh, uh, uh, you know, uh, could you please uh, wrap up quickly? Uh, yes, I am. Quick. Time, yeah. yeah, I'll be, I'll be quick. Uh, so uh, during the Soviet era, what we have is a softer approach. Like when we had the, the people, like there were Ukrainian languages somewhat, you know, used, but it was carefully carved. Again, I say that so that it is not attaining to that, uh, to that level of national awareness. So now, even in, in later in the occupied Crimea and other places, we have burning of books, libraries, closing of Ukrainian schools. And the, these are things that attack on the language. This is very important for me because I'm a native speaker of Bengali. And as we all know what happened in, uh, you know, uh, erstwhile Eastern East Pakistan uh, in, during the Bangladesh war, how uh, the language movement emerged. And I find it rather very, 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 very painful. Another point that I would just touch upon and my colleague will take it up in a more detailed way is the famine. Ukraine is the bread, ba bread basket, but how does it happen that it, had, it was starved to death? You know, a lot of people and in the slide, you can see the estimates vary. And this famine was driven to, uh, to uh, 
expropriate the Kulak class, which is the, uh, the small peasant class. It's not the big peasants or the big landowners. It's the smaller class, so which could have been the middle class and you know the middle class, which could have uh, been the uh, main uh, component of national awareness. Now, the reasons were very many. There were reasons which were given and the world didn't come to know after many, you know, the world came to know by reports of, you know, uh, certain reporters who were then later persecuted. So this was something that from the collective memory, evidences were collected. And it, only in the year 2005, six, this museum was built, the photo you can see, this is a photo of the Holodomor Museum, which I request everyone visiting Kiev to come and visit it. Now, this is extremely important landmark in the history, which uh, talks about annihilation of a nation. Now, here is a map which shows you uh, which are the parts that were greatly affected by this Holodomor, which is starving by death. Uh, I would now, you know, in a few words that summing up that there are certain proven strengths that Ukraine has shown. The resilience of people that I see, I see around, you know, people coming back to their places, rebuilding their homes, repairing everything. So this is, this is extraordinary in the world. And of course, the defensive strategy that even without having proper weapons, it is containing, it is containing an aggressive force. And need I say, the respect for freedom, liberty, and human rights, because one of my friends, uh, Alexandra Matvichu, leading the Center for Civil Liberties, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. And there are human rights fighters who are doing a lot of good work here. So the appeal to representatives of the global south or at least south asia is to is is it not time to think of you know building an alliance of middle powers right and also think of the deterrent foreign policy and think of a different global security architecture so thank with you. this i thank you very much thank you dr right thank you thank you so much thank you for uh, giving that wonderful uh, analysis of uh, uh, Ukraine's, uh, you know, uh, the evolution of the Ukrainian identity and what has shaped Ukraine over the decades. Uh, so, uh, are there, I would like to go to the audience. Are there any uh, questions for uh, Dr. Ghosh? Yes, yes, please. Could we provide the mic? Uh, Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to know if the political nation you are referring to includes also the rights. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. I didn't hear the question. Yeah. Uh, could you could you please repeat the question? Yeah. So thank you for your presentation. And I was thinking, because you referred to the political nation, do you think now Ukraine has the maturity to accord, to grant to some other minorities living in the country some rights, like the right uh, to education in their own language? I refer to Tatars, to Romanians, and other minorities. Uh, well, uh, as far as I know, these rights were there in the Constitution, and you know they have schools, and they have. I mean, it was never a question. This is in the 1991. You know, it was already decided when Ukraine was independent, and the 1996 Constitution clearly mentions this. And as I know, that the national minorities enjoy the same rights as the majority ethnic majority, in the sense that the language has been focused, that this is the state language of Ukraine. Ukrainian should be learned by everybody, but they have a right to engage in uh, propagating, engage in uh, you know, developing their own culture and languages. And uh, I know a number of people who have uh, occupying top posts in, uh, in different departments. Uh, among them are Crimean Tatars. Among them are other nationalities, Armenians, uh, many others. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, the, you know, and thank you for your answer. Thank you for your time uh, all the way from Kiev. Uh, I know it's not easy. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, the, your wonderful presentation here. So.
Next, uh, we'll <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, you know Dr. Anastasia Biliavsky, uh, you know who is going to join us all the way from UK, and uh, her topic is Ukraine's and India's famines and the fall of empires, and why this is Ukraine's war of independence. Uh, Dr. Biliavsky, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can okay. Oh, yeah. the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rudra Neil. Uh, thank you, Mridhula, for, um, for your talk. Um, I have just returned from Odessa in the south of Ukraine, which is one of my two homes. I, I divide my life between Cambridge in the UK um, and, and Odessa in Ukraine. Um, so that's why I, I'm certain of having electricity, because I, I, I wouldn't have been certain about, of that three days ago when I was still in Odessa. Now, um, I... Uh, would like to begin by saying absolutely unequivocally that this is Ukraine's war of independence. It's very much its war, it's not anyone else's war, and that's what I would like to try to convince you of today, because the myth, the very provocative myth uh, for people in Ukraine who have fought with their bare hands, who have uh, um, really spent a year and eight years before that fighting for their independence and sacrificing a huge amount of um, their comfort and many, many lives. Um, the, the narrative, the imperial narrative, that uh, this is a proxy war, that uh, the agency lies elsewhere, that Ukraines are puppets, um, a, um, a toy in the hands of larger powers, um, that narrative has got to break. Um, so um, I will begin by telling you a little bit about um, it. So it's not, it's a war of independence that Ukraine certainly did not choose for itself. It did not fall for it. It had really very much hoped that it could gain its independence without blood, um, quietly, simply by um, um, by by acquiring sovereign statehood in 1991, um, and um, the the fact that Ukraine has given up its nuclear nuclear arsenal, that it's given up uh, a huge number of long range missiles, it would have really could could have done with now, and has disarmed right up till to 2014. You can see that the military budget is falling shows that until the very last minute, and even until the 24th of February this year, Ukrainians had hoped to gain their independence with no blood. They had hoped, they, it's a country that has never attacked anyone, it's a country that simply wanted it into its independence. Unfortunately, it was not allowed its independence without blood. Unfortunately, um, hundreds of thousands of people have died already since the 24th of February, and in the eight years before that, this is a little known fact, 14,000 Ukrainian soldiers had died from Russian aggression in the Donbass. Um, so, um, this is Ukraine's war, and um, and um, Dr. Ghosh was saying that um, you know colonialism is, of course, colonialism and imperialism doesn't um, suffer easy comparisons, simple comparisons. But Ukraine really very much is a colonial state, which is very similar um, to India in relation to the British Empire. Why is that? Ukraine, just like India, has been what I would call an essential colony, um, a colony with a very special status, you know, the jewel in the British, in the crown of the British Empire for India, which had a um, which had been the richest and um, prized um, for the British Empire and had a different status from colonies in Africa. The same is true of Ukraine. It's um, the the the, it's the real jewel. It's the colony without which there is no empire, which is why in its last throngs, um, the Russian empire is, um, is expending all of its military resources to try to hold on to Ukraine, because without it, there is no Russian empire. Uh, once you let go of Ukraine, Russia becomes a nation, a state like any others, uh, which is not what it's um, government and its um, vast majority of its citizens 
believe, they genuinely believe, um, this is a narrative that's propagated in the Russian media sources, that Russians are superior, they're a superior race, they are imperial people, they're not um, citizens of a nation state like all others in this world, and they have the right to conquer, to educate, to civilize, um, to do as they please to um, all the others. Um, now, as an essential colony, the most important colony, um, India and Ukraine um, share these three characteristics. Um, there are three things that the um, imperial metropolis has uh, three um, mm, approaches to um, holding on to, cultivating, and um, holding under control um, these, these colonies that have been used. One, is the cultivation and the education of the elites, which um, Dr. Grotius mentioned. So Ukraine has had a lot of its um, artistic literary talent has been cultivated by um, the Russian metropolis um, under the Soviet um, uh, stage of the Russian empire. Um, Ukrainians filled the Kremlin. There were many of the Soviet leaders, in fact, the leaders under whom relations between the Soviet Union and India blossomed were from Ukraine. Um, just as, you know, um, there's a long history of, of a serious presence of um, Indian elites in all spheres of British life. Um, but while cultivating the educated elites, um, these essential colonies have both been subject to fierce repression um, on two fronts. Any national assertion was fiercely repressed, both in India and in, in Ukraine, and also the peasantry has been fiercely repressed. Um, as um, the section of the population that isn't, uh, that is quite potentially wealthy, that um, is large on mass, both are large agrarian nations. Um, and I have a history in my own family and many families in Ukraine, because it's such a large agrarian nation, just like in India, most families have family, in, most families who live in cities have family in villages. Um, and on my mother's side, my uh, nani comes from a small village, um, and uh, her parents were subject to the repressions of the 1930s, which are known as the Holodomor, but it was a real complex of repressive activities, which ranged from um, withholding and destroying um, foodstuffs so that people would be artificially starved, uh, but it also involved uh, enormous uh, repressions of peasants who were sent to the gulags. Um, so this is, um, let me just see, I will share my screen. Um, now, um, this is a picture taken in 1931. This is a wedding of my great grandparents, Maria and Volodymyr. Um, they are in central, central um, Eastern Ukraine. Um, this is a year before uh, what's known as Holodomor, 1932-1933, um, hits Ukraine. Um, this is a Stalin-made um, repression, large-scale repression of the peasants, who were um, deemed as um, difficult to control, difficult to rule. They were not um, joining easily the, the, the revolution. And of course, they weren't only repressed in Ukraine, but Ukraine was the real hub of the repression of peasants. So 1931, nine months later, my grandmother is born. Um, and um, another five months later, um, Volodymyr, her father, is taken away to the gulags to Siberia. Um, he is charged with being a kulak, which literally means the fist, and uh, charged with withholding foodstuffs. Um, my gr the fact that my grandmother survived having been an has to do with the fact that she was a baby and breastfeeding at the time. She wouldn't have survived otherwise. In the village where I spent most of my summers, um, there was hardly anyone of her age um, around because most of them had died. Um, he was taken away to Siberia. He had managed to run away five years later. His, his, um, his wife, Maria, here, she... Uh, was told that the humane Soviet uh, state would not um, send 
the mother of a baby who was not yet one year old uh, to the gulags, but they will come for her when the baby turns one. So she had to run away. My grandmother was raised by her aunt. Um, everyone was in hiding. Five years later, my grandfather managed to escape the gulags and um, meet up with his family in the Donbass and spend another two years living there with them. He was then again captured and sent to um, to the gulags, where he, in the end, um, my grandmother dug up the archives. He had poisoned himself with soap um, in 1951, just two years before Stalin died. Um, so these kinds of stories run through Ukrainian society. This is not an, an external imposition. This is not an invention. This is not uh, a conflict that has been cr created by outside powers, you know, uh, to to create enmity among um, brethren brethren people. Um, now, um, as um, Dr. Gersh pointed out, this is part of a very long-standing and very pervasive narrative that um, the that Russia. Um, cultivates and 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 pervades um, that simply negates Ukraine um, as as a political entity and as any kind of agent. So just as um, you know, British imperialists famously thought that Indians couldn't possibly govern themselves because they're not cultivated enough. They're not, they're infantile. They're not clever enough. They have no capacity. They have no agency. They cannot be agents of their own destiny. Um, in the same way, Ukrainians have been denied um, agency um, in the political sphere because it's only the powers, the greater powers, whether it's the Americans or the Russians um, that can actually have a say in what goes on. Now, um, let me fast forward. I will, uh, I will leave this picture for you to look at. They're quite a lovely looking couple, I think. Um, but um, I will fast forward to a very, very recent history, which I will say a few things about uh, in a very, a very granular history, both a potted history of um, America's um, relations, recent relations with, um, with Russia and with Ukraine, and a very granular history, but a, but a quick one, of uh, the Biden administration's relations with Putin's uh, administration and, and with Ukraine, just to get rid of any trace of a doubt that, uh, you know, this is a, a conflict that was instigated in any sense by um, America's will. Um, now, Ukraine's relation with, relations with the United States have been very strained from the start. Um, when in 1994, Bill Clinton really bullied Ukraine's president um, into giving up Ukraine's nuclear arsenal. So um, there's, there's, there are accounts of, uh, of Bill Clinton really, um, together with, um, with Yeltsin, um, in a sense, agreeing that for Ukrainians to give up the arsenal and Bill Clinton um, basically said to, to, to the Ukrainian then president then that um, there will be no uh, financial support which Ukraine um, directly needed if Ukraine doesn't give up its um, nuclear arsenal. Um, more recent American presidents have unabashedly taken Russia's side and uh, Barack Obama let Putin get away with annexing the Crimea and invading starting a war in Donbass. Um, he also presided over the Minsk agreements, which forced Ukraine into a series of concessions in exchange for a Russian ceasefire that never really materialized. Um, I think we all know that Trump was quite an open um, 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 fan of Putin's and he praised Putin for the capture of Crimea and called the buildup of troops on Ukraine's borders in um, 2021 a genius move and said that Ukraine, Kiev would fall very quickly. Um, Biden relentlessly courted Putin right up to the war, um, waving sanctions um, on the Nord Stream um, um, 2, which was um, Russia's second uh, pipeline um, pumping gas into Europe, intended to pump gas into Europe. 
Um, Biden also established a new security partnership with Russia and invited Putin to a lakeside summit. And I will say a little bit more about the sequence of events because this is really important. Um, and at the summit, he again agreed to press Ukraine on the Minsk agreements, which um, undermine Ukraine's territorial integrity, um, its sovereignty. Um, it's, it's, it's a series of concessions by Ukraine. Um, now, B Biden's administration has always been opposed to Ukraine's accession to NATO, um, and it largely denied military aid to Ukraine before the war. It also removed its fleet from the Black Sea on the very eve of the invasion, while um, um, purveying the news that Russia is about to mount a full-scale invasion. Um, and in a gesture of diplomatic uh, disrespect and disdain, it didn't even bother to appoint an ambassador to Ukraine until spring of 2022. Um, it took months of Ukraine's dazzling military performance, the horrors of Bucha, the mass graves, dozens of thousands of people murdered in Mariupol, and a tsunami of popular outrage across the world and in the United States to start very slowly very um, gruelingly to shift Biden's administration of its um, concessive, um, friendly um, position towards Putin's Russia. Um, Dr. Piliafsi, could you uh, please wrap up quickly? Yes, yeah. Um, so um, I, I will wrap up. It's exactly the point at which I'd like to wrap up. Um, I can say in questions, I can say a little bit more in detail about, um, you know, um, Biden's relation with, with Putin's administration. Um, but in the end, um, it has taken, I've been personally involved since the start of the full scale invasion in uh, communications inside the Biden administration among American congressmen um, and people who have been trying to push for aid to Ukraine. And it took a very long time to start shifting the ice. And the ice was um, the strategic uh, position that the American administration had adopted a long time ago and had stuck to, which is uh, a position of non-aggression towards Russia, um, doing business as usual, um, trading, um, creating shared um, security alliances um, and basically collaborating. And um, the, the, it is the Ukrainians and their courage and what they have done, something that nobody in the world believed would happen, um, is stop Russian aggression with very minimal means that has actually changed that. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so so much, Dr. Piliavsky. Uh, you know, the, thank you for your insights uh, on the Holodomor and, and your personal uh, family story. Uh, you know, uh, it was uh, really, uh, uh, you know, moving. Uh, uh, I would uh, now, uh, well, any questions? Any questions for uh, Dr. Piliavsky? Yeah, please. Anyone? Oh, okay. So then, We'll move, uh, move on to an online question that just uh, came in. Uh, this is from uh, Anandita Ghoshal. As India and, and Ukraine share almost the same history, given that both were co colonized by different powers, uh, what is lacking uh, between us in terms of bilateral relations? Um, so I think, uh, uh, this is the question, how can India and Ukraine come closer? Right, um, right. I think there's, there's a diplomatic history, and I think it's the High Commissioner who can say a bit more about that. And also, um, Rohini Hensman will talk about um, what it is that gets in the way of, um, of understanding. But one simple fact is that um, there is a memory of the Soviet Union that is extremely uh, durable across the global south and indeed across um, a lot of intellectual circles um, around the world, um, which uh, in, see, thinks of, um, it's, it's a sort of feeling rather than more than thinking, um, but it's a feeling that Russia is the natural heir to the Soviet Union and it's, it's, the, it's the Soviet Union of today. It's very difficult to imagine anything uh, 
that is further from the truth. Um, the Soviet Union was indeed a, a socialist alternative to the capitalist uh, world that we otherwise live in. It offered ideological alternatives, it offered educational alternatives, it really was an alternative power and it did champion the post-colonial world indeed. Um, Russia today is as fiercely consumerist and capitalist and anti-socialist as it gets, despite its use of the of the communist symbolism and red flags and sickles and hammers. And it doesn't at all champion the anti um, the post-colonial world, apart from Putin's rhetoric, which he simply uses um, to stoke up anti-American sentiment. Um, I think I think it's uh, been uh, um, a weakness of Ukraine's diplomacy, that it has not developed um, better relations with a lot of countries ac across the global south, not just um, not just India. Um, but I think that is also part of this post-colonial hangover and a lack of confidence in one's own agency. Um, the, the idea that, you know, uh, only Russia, among all the post-Soviet states, had real political agency, um, goes deep. And I hope this moment, this war where um, Ukrainians have proven that they have incredible agency, that uh, they have changed the course of history in important ways, will give um, the uh, Ukrainian diplomacy the courage to form new um, robust relations. And the India-Ukraine relations are the most obvious, two large agrarian nations with um, colonial pasts um, and long-standing ties. Um, it, it is uh, Nikita Khrushchev who coined the term, after all, Rusi Bharatiya Bhai Bhai. Um, it was he who said that. It was under him that the real um, Soviet um, friendship between um, India and, and the Soviet Union that had started. So I hope it has a bright future, Ukraine-India. Right. So, so then, uh, Dr. Piliyasi, let me ask you uh, one of my questions. Uh, you see, like, you know, when uh, in 1971, uh, when the liberation war in uh, Bangladesh was uh, going on, uh, there, there was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, outpouring of sympathy from Indians uh, for uh, the Bangladeshis. Uh, and uh, this, was this was very, very organic. Now, we, we don't see that uh, in case of the Ukraine war today. Like, you know, many Indians uh, don't have that kind of, uh, you know, sympathy for the Ukrainians as they should. So how can we address this? How can we, uh, you know, because what is happening in Ukraine is terrible and it's, it's genocidal. So, oh, and there are parallels here, clear parallels here with, with what happened in Bangladesh in 71. So how can we address uh, this dissonance? Um, again, I, I actually think it's untrue that Indians don't feel sympathy for Ukraine. Um, there is a huge amount of sympathy and empathy and, and horror and, and raw human um, solidarity and, and shock at what's going on in Ukraine. But it's this um, sense of historic loyalty to Russia come the Soviet Union that gets in the way of many people um, um, really uh, fully expressing their empathy and their solidarity with Ukraine, because again, it's Russia that's the, in, in the minds of many, that's the heir, that's the Soviet Union of today, which is the old friend of India, rather than Ukraine, which is historically inaccurate, um, uh, and as it is ethnographically inaccurate about Russia today and about the history of relations between um, Ukraine and India. Right, right. And thank, and hopefully, like, you know, events like this can change that uh, perception Absolutely. gradually in, in India. Thank I also so think, I, uh, just one, one more thing, I think it's important to have debates about this, not just nice conversations. I think people should be invited to ask Absolutely. burning, pointed, uh, belligerent questions, and we should, we should talk about things openly. Um, Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pilyavsky, like, you know, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, moving along, uh, next we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rohini Hensman, and uh, she will, uh, you know, talk to us about why a large section 
of the anti-imperialists anti -imperial uh, have not shown solidarity with the Ukrainians. This is something that I myself have wondered, like, you know, given that we have so many uh, leftist uh, parties, socialist parties in, in India, but not many of them, or in fact, hardly any of them have actually come out openly in support of Ukraine. So uh, why why is that? Why, why is there this uh, lack of sympathy uh, from anti-imperialists when this should be a, a, a sitter? I mean, there they should be, a, a, you know, no questions about, you know, showing sympathy for Ukraine in, in these circumstances. Dr. Dr. Hensman, you're the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, from the previous presentations, it should be obvious that the USSR was not a union of equal republics. It was an empire in which Russia dominated the former Tsarist colonies, sometimes in extremely cruel ways. I think Lenin envisaged a different setup from the centralized and crucified Tsarist empire. And he did try to bring about equality as the civil war was winding down. On December 30th, 1922, the first Congress of Soviets of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics approved the treaty on the formation of the USSR. <coughs> Excuse me. Lenin insisted on a clause proclaiming the right to self-determination including secession from the USSR. Lenin did make some serious mistakes, but in this, he was absolutely correct. If the USSR was to be a voluntary union of equal republics, every republic had to be free to secede from it. After Lenin died in January 1924, the struggle for succession was eventually won by Stalin, who proceeded to reverse most of Lenin's policies. The Soviet republics were once again brought under the rule of Moscow and once again crucified. The secret protocols of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, signed by Ribbentrop and Molotov on 23rd August 1939, effectively made Stalin a Nazi collaborator, supplying the Nazis with food and raw materials in return for the go-ahead to recolonize Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and part of Poland. Only when Hitler abrogated the pact by invading the Soviet Union on 22nd June 1941, did Stalin stop collaborating with him. The post-war Yalta agreement allowed him to set up Moscow-dominated regimes in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, and later East Germany further extending the Russian empire. But in order to portray himself as Lenin's closest comrade, he retained the clause in the constitution, granting the republic's freedom to secede, although in practice it remained a dead letter. Stalin's successes mostly continued with his policy for until Gorbachev came to power. Unlike his predecessors, Gorbachev had a genuine commitment to democracy and aversion to violence. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, he didn't send in Russian tanks. He was in the process of trying to sign a more equal treaty with the non-Russian republics of the USSR when Stalinist hardliners staged a coup and put him under house arrest. The coup collapsed and Gorbachev was freed but he was sidelined by Yeltsin. In December 1991, Yeltsin presided over the disintegration of the Soviet Union into 15 independent republics, including the Russian Federation and Ukraine. The process was chaotic and destructive, but I agree that we can see it as a process of decolonization. Yeltsin handed over power to Putin an agent of the secret police or KGB, which later became the FSB. Putin was harshly critical of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. In 2016, he accused Lenin of putting a time bomb under the Russian state by insisting on the right to self-determination. In a series of articles and speeches in the run-up to the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, he accused Lenin and the Bolsheviks of creating Ukraine by chopping off part of Russia. He approved of Stalin's quote-unquote totalitarian regime, but criticized him for not cleansing the constitution of what he called 
the odious and utopian fantasies inspired by the revolution. He wanted to go one step further than Stalin, not just reversing the revolution, but also wiping out its ideals and going back to the ideals of the Tsarist empire. In the Russian Federation itself, this has meant increasing concentration of power in his hands and successive blows against the independence of the judiciary, free and fair elections, and freedom of expression, association, and peaceful assembly, as well as attacks on women's rights and LGBT plus rights. Russian Marxist Ilya Budraitskis calls this fascism from above and feels that the so-called special military operation has dealt the final blow to democracy, with the state now intruding even into private life. In foreign policy, the annexation of parts of Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, and now the assault on the whole of Ukraine, signals Putin's imperial ambitions. He sponsors extreme right-wing groups and parties in Europe and has close ties with white supremacists in the US. The Russian paramilitary Wagner group, whose brutal neo-Nazi Rusic unit was active in Donbass, has fought for Bashar al-Assad in Syria and Khalifa Haftar in Libya, both guilty of crimes against humanity. It has backed authoritarian dictators and military coups in Mali, Central African Republic, and Burkina Faso in return for gold and diamond mining concessions. Such practices when carried out by the West have rightly been characterized as imperialism. Given all this, it's not surprising that authoritarian regimes around the world have supported Putin's invasion of Ukraine, either voting with Russia and the UN or claiming to be neutral and abstaining. So far as I'm concerned, neutrality in this situation is like watching a man rape a woman and saying, I'm not going to take sides, I'm neutral. And that's not my metaphor, it's Putin's. At a press conference shortly before he invaded in February 2022, he quoted from a Russian punk rock song which goes, sleeping beauty in a coffin, I crept up and raped her. Whether you like it or don't like it, bear with it, my beauty, implying that he intended to rape a dead Ukraine. More surprisingly, a number of people who call themselves anti-imperialist and anti-war activists also support Putin, either openly or by repeating his propaganda. I started looking into this phenomenon after Putin intervened in Syria in September 2015. And I was horrified to find that some of the people who had been on the same side as me when I was demonstrating against the US wars on Vietnam, Afghanistan and Iraq, and Israel's occupation of Palestine, were now on the other side, never criticizing Putin for bombing hospitals, schools, mosques, markets, and apartment blocks in Syria. Further research showed that Syria was not an isolated case. This section of self-professed anti-imperialists also backed or prevaricated about the genocide of Bosnian Muslims by Serb nationalists, Iran's brutal theocracy and its murderous intervention in Syria, and Putin's annexation of Crimea and invasion of the Donbas at that time. In my book, Indefensible, democracy, counter-revolution, and the rhetoric of anti-imperialism, I try to explain and classify these pseudo-anti-imperialists. One section are neo-Stalinists. Unlike the original Stalinists, who supported Lenin and the Russian Revolution, these people back Putin, who curses Lenin and wants to reverse the Russian Revolution. There are many such people here in India and in the Indian diaspora like Vijay Prashad, for example. Then there was a section that was so focused on opposing anything and everything the Western powers did that they automatically took the opposite side, regardless of how despotic or imperialist it was. Some of these people like Medea Benjamin and Kurt Pink never criticized Putin or the Iranian theocracy. 
The others criticize Putin, sometimes quite harshly. Yet at the same time, they repeat his propaganda. For example, that the Euromaidan protest movement was a coup masterminded by Washington, and the Russian annexation of Crimea was legitimate. Sadly, for me at least, this section includes people who have done good work in the past, like John Pilger and even Noam Chomsky. In the wake of Putin's 2022 invasion of Ukraine, they either kept quiet or condemned the invasion in one sentence, but then went on to make excuses for Putin and to undermine the Ukrainian resistance at much greater length. We have two main lines of argument. One, the real culprits are NATO and the West. Two, the Ukrainians are also to blame for the war. Let's examine some of their arguments. One, NATO is to blame because it expanded into Eastern Europe, thereby posing a threat to Russia, and therefore Putin was forced to respond. This argument ignores the fact that it was the countries in Eastern Europe which took the initiative to join NATO, precisely because they wanted to avoid the fate that has befallen Ukraine. A presupposition of this argument, which goes along with the claim that Ukrainians are simply tools of NATO and the West, is that East Europeans are fools without any agency of their own which of course we don't agree with. Another assumption is that imperial superpowers have a right to spheres of influence in which they can dominate smaller, weaker countries. If we go along with this pre presumption, we would have to agree that just as Russia has the right to dominate the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the US has a right to dominate countries of the Caribbean and Latin America. I disagree with both propositions. They claim that the US and NATO are preventing the Ukrainians from negotiating with Russia and coming to an agreement. This is not true. There have been negotiations and some are still ongoing over prisoner exchanges, for example. But after the cruelty inflicted on the Ukrainian people, they would throw out any government that want to, wanted to compromise with Putin's demands. It's the Ukrainian people, not the Western powers, who are blocking a compromise. And they have every right to do so because it is their country which has been invaded. NATO hasn't fired a single shot or lost a single soldier. The arguments that, that blame Ukraine remind me of the victim blaming that so often takes place in rape cases. They use the example of the Azov Brigade to imply that Ukraine is dominated by racists and fascists, although the Ukrainian government has taken steps to disempower Azov. It's true there are racists and fascists in Ukraine, and that is a cause for concern. But fascists are much weaker in Ukraine than in many other countries. The far-right parties didn't win a single seat in the 2019 parliamentary elections. And Russian-speaking Jewish Zelensky won a landslide victory in the presidential election. UN reports on racism have only mild criticisms of Ukraine. At a time when anti-Muslim racism is rampant in non-Muslim countries, Ukraine is much better than most and has a much better record than Russia. For example, in Crimea, which has Russia has resumed Stalin's ethnic cleansing of indigenous Crimean Tatars after taking over Crimea. Criticizing the victim, that's Ukraine, without denouncing the perpetrator, which is Russia, only makes it easier for Putin's fascist regime to seize more territory in Ukraine. The same is true of countless proposals by self-professed anti-war activists that the West should stop supplying weapons to Ukrainians and put pressure on them to negotiate a deal with the Kremlin, giving up part of the territory that Russia has occupied. To uh, me, this is strongly what reminiscent of the Munich Agreement between Chamberlain and Galadier on one side, Hitler and Mussolini on the other. 
forcing Czechoslovakia to give up part of its territory to the Nazis. In a way, it's even worse. We know the horrific crimes against humanity that have been committed in Ukrainian territories occupied by Russian forces. The rape, torture, mass graves, and deportation of millions of Ukrainian civilians to the Russian Federation. We know with hindsight that the Munich appeasement of fascists precipitated World War II. So why would anyone want to repeat that mistake? It has become obvious by now that Putin will not stop until he is defeated. That is the only way to end the war. And it should be ended as soon as possible for the sake of Ukraine, Russia, and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hensman, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so a couple of questions coming in online. Uh, okay, uh, perhaps you could uh, take uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Hensman. Uh, how can trustful relations between Ukraine and Russia be built? That's a loaded word, trustful. Well, right. Well, I think starting to start off um, by telling the truth. Uh, for example, for weeks before the 20, February 2022 invasion, Putin kept saying, there will not be an invasion, we are not going to invade, we are not going to invade. And then he invaded. Okay, that is not a way to build up trust. If you want to build up trust, you have to tell the truth. I think there are people in Russia who are trying to tell the truth, but they are not allowed to. I mean, the ones that it has declined to the, uh, to the extent that someone standing in the street with a blank sheet of paper can be arrested. So what needs to happen is for Russians to have the freedom to tell the truth, and then there will be trust. I think that's the short answer. Right, any, any questions uh, from the audience? Okay, so then let, let me ask you one of my questions, uh, uh, Dr. Hensman. Right now, as you, as you mentioned, like, you know, there are various reasons why people are, I would say, sitting on the sidelines, you know, not, not uh, you know, throwing their weight behind Ukraine. But I would like to ask you, what is the cost of not supporting Ukraine at this point of time? What is the cost for the world if we don't stand up for Ukraine at this point of time? Oh, I think there are huge costs. I mean, one thing is, um, it's a struggle for democracy, I think, as uh, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Pilyavsky have also said. If we don't, we have to stand up for democracy anywhere and everywhere in our own country and in every country of the world, because I think every victory of democracy is a victory for all of us. And any defeat for democracy is likewise a defeat for all of us who are fighting for democracy. So that is one reason. But there are a lot of very um, uh, you know, practical uh, things as well, not that just ideological. Food, for example. People sometimes seem to blame the sanctions against Russia for the fact that food prices have risen. They seem to forget that there would be no sanctions if Russia had not invaded Ukraine. And Ukraine, as uh, I think uh, Dr. Gore said, the breadbasket of the world. If once Ukraine is invaded, once its wheat fields are destroyed, its uh, sunflower fields are destroyed, we all suffer. Here in India, we're suffering from it. So let's try and get this war over as fast as possible because the rest of the world is suffering because of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hensman. So uh, that concludes uh, the presentation uh, part of uh, the program. And uh, now we would like to turn our attention to our partners. Uh, in Nepal, we have NIICE. Uh, now, th this, is, this is very important because, you know, uh, uh, Nepal is a country that is also uh, in its own, uh, you know, uh, geopolitical uh, struggle. Uh, I one could say, like you know, it is it, it is bordered by two giant neighbors, so they have their own uh, geopolitical calculations. And I know that uh, you know Nepal has been keenly observing uh, events in Ukraine. In fact, many in uh, Nepal opine that you know what what happened in Ukraine could possibly one day happen in Nepal. So 
I would like to go over to Saroj Deo, uh, research assistant from uh, NIICE. Saroj, are you there with us? Saroj, are you there with us? Oh. Saroj, yeah. Are you there, there with us from Kathmandu? Yeah, okay. Yeah, nice to see you, Saroj. Yeah, your, your microphone uh, is muted. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Saroj. Uh, yeah, nice, nice to see you. So, so Saroj, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, moderator. First of all, let first of all let me briefly introduce Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent or political and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where the sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflict are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. We have organized five programs since the Russia war in Ukraine. They are on 14 March 2022, Russia-Ukraine conflict and the emerging global order. On 30 September 2022, Russia-Ukraine war is Putin losing. On 21st October 2022, Russian invasion on Ukraine and its global impact perspective from the Poland. On 26 October 2022, the Russia-Ukraine war and the Middle East Western misperception exposed. On 19 December 2022, the Russia-Ukrainian war causes and consequences. So Nepal supported Ukraine. It is not because Nepal is against Russia, but on the basis of norms and values carried by Nepal. Nepal is a democracy and democracy and support democracy around the world. We believe that any problem and conflict should be resolved through dialogue by peaceful means. On behalf of NICE, I would also like to take this golden opportunity to thank all our speaker for such an insightful and enlightening delivering on their topic. We'd also like to thank the moderator, participant, and our partners for joining their hands to make the roundtable discussion successful. This kind of engagement discussion is crucial and also be continue in future as well in order to prevalence democracy, rule of law, peace, and to support the norms and values of the UN. Once again, I would like to thank you all for your valuable presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Saroj. Before you, before you go, let me, let me just ask you, uh, I mean, uh, about Nepal's perspective. Uh, you know what 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 exactly is Nepal's perspective on the war in uh, uh, Europe, and uh, how does Nepal see the war, and how is it changing its uh, you know ge geopolitical calculations, if at all? So, excuse me. Yes, am I audible? Yeah, you're your audible, sir. Yeah. And regarding Nepal perspective, since uh, Russia invasion in Ukraine, Nepal is always supporting uh, Ukraine as Nepal as a democratic uh, democracy country, and uh, Nepal has always been a uh, neutral in terms of uh, international uh, conflict. If you will see the context of uh, even uh, China and then. Uh, uh, India, or we, if we will see the context of uh, earlier uh, conflict, uh, so uh, earlier conflict in the different region and different parts of the uh, world, Nepal has been always the played role as a neutral, and Nepal is uh, obviously, as you mentioned, Nepal is ensuring each and every activities of, particularly in Russia and overall world, how they have been. Uh, uh, 
taking part how they have been looking after these issues so uh, nepal is ensuring over uh, is an every activities uh, in particular russia and overall world but then nepal is neutral in this case and will be uh, always support uh, ukraine uh, uh, ukraine in these uh, conditions right Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saroj. It's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, next, I would like to go to our uh, southern uh, neighbor, Sri Lanka. So uh, we have two, as, as I said before, we have two partners uh, for this event from Sri Lanka. Uh, first, I would like to go to uh, Dr. Uh, Pakya Sothi uh, Sarvanamutu, uh, who is the executive. Oh, we have... Do we have uh, Dr. Sarvanamutu first from the Center for Policy Alternatives? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Dr. Sarvanamutu. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the, the virtual floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I represent the Center for Policy Alternatives in Colombo, Sri Lanka, which is a non-governmental, non-partisan organization that focuses on issues of conflict transformation and governance from a human rights perspective through programs of research and advocacy. And so we have done a lot of work in terms of, you know, what types of political settlements are necessary for the conflict in Sri Lanka in particular. We, our work, particularly after 2009, has been increasingly more human rights related because of the situation in our country. In 2009, the government won a war against the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam and then it promised to go for a political settlement. There were all sorts of allegations against both the government and the LTT of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which have yet to be examined. And that demand for a proper investigation continues. So with regard to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, let me just first say that from our point of view, we strongly condemn the human rights atrocities that have been committed against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, because as far as we are concerned, we cannot have a decent international system or society where human rights, whether it be war or whether it be peace, are flagrantly violated in this way. We therefore, right to reinforce our support and solidarity with the Ukrainian people for effective remedies for those transgressions. Secondly, we as an organization that is committed to conflict transformation to the questions of governance and human rights, again, we recognize that we need an international system that is based on firm principles that are respected by all the members of the international system. And our understanding is that from roughly 1648 and the Treaty of Westphalia, national sovereignty was to be respected. That it was to be respected irrespective of the size of the country, irrespective of the composition of the country, that there is a territorial inviability of boundaries and that force was not the answer to outstanding disputes. That without that, there would not be any international order. Might would be right. We condemn that. And we see that the Russian government under Vladimir Putin has blatantly ignored this basic fundamental founding principle of the international system. Now, having said all that, we understand that this is a war that is 
needlessly devastating all of us in minor degrees and major degrees, and it's going to get worse. And therefore, there has to be a diplomatic conclusion to it, a conclusion that is right and just, and which the rights of the Ukrainian people are foremost in our minds. And therefore, we pray that it could come to that conclusion sooner rather than later. With regard to the Sri Lankan government's position on this conflict, we, as some of you may know, have been through the worst crisis of governance that we've ever faced. We didn't have any US dollars to buy anything. We were rock bottom broke. And in that situation, yes, our government did look to Russia for assistance with regard to oil and was less than unequivocal in terms of its condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine. Necessity in that respect led our policy or defined our policy um, at that point. However, I think that there are a majority, that there is a majority of Sri Lankans who would unequivocally condemn Putin's invasion and hope that there will be a resolution of the conflict in which mm. the rights of the Ukrainian people are foremost. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarvanamuthu. Thank you for your inputs. Uh, next, I would li like to go to uh, Dr. Mahim Mendes. Uh, he is the Chief Academic Advisor of the Rainbow Institute of Communication, Sri Lanka. Dr. Mendes, welcome. The f uh, can you hear me? Right. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, 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 Dr. Mendes. Uh, Wonderful. Welcome. welcome. Thank you for joining us. So, Thank you very much uh, the, for this the, opportunity. And uh, the virtual floor is yours. Greetings from Rainbow Institute of Communication in Sri Lanka an institute playing a catalytic role in positively influencing the democratic way of life of people everywhere. We are privileged to take a firm position on the side of freedom. When leaders and institutions within states believe in an authoritarian ethos, such an ethos, you will all know, goes against democratic consultation, consensus and compromise in local and international decision making and handling of disputes. As stated by Dr. Pilyaski, this is Ukraine's own struggle for independence. I feel greatly encouraged by Dr. Hensman's position that we should express solidarity with everyone fighting for freedom, freedom with dignity. We at Rainbow Institute takes a politically value-centered position that the current actions of the Russian state led by President Putin should essentially galvanize the international community even more in condemning military-led brutalities against innocent men, women, and children of Ukraine, believing firmly in their own dignity. We see that no meaningful discussions can take place in the midst of accelerated brutalities against the sovereign people of Ukraine. International disputes arising from geopolitical and cultural realities demand even more rational civilized and sustainable 
methodologies. There is no doubt about that. Right now, we are compelled to believe that the world is more anarchic with no credible international authority and that nations like Ukraine are left to defend and look after their national interest based on their own economic, moral and military strength. We are quite awake to lessons learned through our own Sri Lankan political theater for decades after political independence, that it is humanity that would essentially lose with aggressive, power-hungry, self-conceited leaders who exploited, like what happened in Sri Lanka, economic, religious, ethnic, and political factors as a means to wage war on people. This is while justifying themselves with the help of a mindless junta and their own henchmen. Ukraine's struggle for freedom as much as ours need far-sighted solutions to avoid further escalation with interference from external forces with their own crooked vested interests, our incapacity to respect grievances of ethnic groups, respecting their dignity, resulted in a deadly ethno-political conflict with unprecedented bloodshed and loss of dignity, loss of dignity for all people including members of the Sri Lankan Armed Forces, later the Indian Armed Forces and militants. We also witnessed, we also witnessed the assassinations of two of the most promising leaders of Sri Lanka and India, President Ranasinghe Premadas and Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi due to the aggravated political crisis with major implications for India and Sri Lanka. What is even more dangerous is that external interference when allowed probably leads to the installation of regimes that are favorable to dominant states and their actors. In the context of the Sri Lankan ethnopolitical crisis, Sri Lanka saw an accord signed by India with a clearly divided Sri Lankan government, dictating terms to all how things should be. From a realist point of view, while engaging in this dialogue, we also see Russia's own vulnerability in the midst of NATO's intentions in the post-Soviet uh, era and principally Ukraine's affiliations to NATO becoming detrimental to Russian interests. Realists obviously argue that membership of Ukraine in NATO would make the region more unstable and such entry would compel powers ideologically hostile to Russia protect Ukraine formally. We appreciate in a way Ukrainian leader Zelensky's position that they should not seek NATO membership in the middle of a deadly war. He probably understands that post-war Ukraine should not have a hostile neighbor, Russian neighbor, jeopardizing the interests of common people of Ukraine. But the final decision belongs to the sovereign people of Ukraine, even on this matter. Once again, in conclusion, we at Rainbow clearly defend democratic values in conflict resolution with equal dignity for all stakeholders and appeal to like-minded people everywhere to firmly press 
that functional democracy should be the central element of society, that international institutions and frameworks should enhance. That is the way multinational cooperation with common good will not be jeopardized. As all states are inter inter interdependent on one another for the trade of goods, services, and finances, as and most essentially for collective human survival, a policy based on rational consultation consensus and compromise is always superior to forcibly pushing one's will down the throat of another. Right now in this dialogue, we are privileged to involve, we cannot be on the side of the aggressor with unsustainable military strategies resulting in mass destruction. This is as if we have not learned any lessons from 20th century wars in the very same region. Our Ukrainian brothers and sisters need peace right now, as much as the innocent people of Russia, who are the receiving end of Putin-led aggression, Russian aggression. As mentioned earlier, we are most sensitive to this scenario since we Sri Lankans are still paying for the sins committed by unenlightened political leaders in the post-independence period in Sri Lanka. We wish post-Soviet Ukrainians and Russians sustainable peace and stability in the days to come. We are certainly on the side of innocent Ukrainians who are at the receiving end of aggression. Greetings once again from Rainbow Institute. Thank you very much for arranging this international dialogue. We wish you and your efforts nothing but the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mendes. Thank you for your powerful and uh, impassioned uh, intervention. Thank you so much. Now, uh, with that, we, we come to the final section of uh, the program today, which is uh, the Q&A discussion section. Uh, here, we, we invite uh, the audience to uh, ask any questions uh, to any of our uh, panelists uh, who are available. Uh, so please, please feel free to uh, uh, you know, come forward and ask any questions if you have. Are there any questions? Uh, all right, then, then, then I could uh, perhaps take some questions uh, which have come in online. Uh, this uh, is directed to Dr. Mridhila Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh, are you still there with us? Yes, I'm with us. You... Right, 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 Dr. Ghosh. Uh, this is from uh, Vivekananda Ghosh, uh, and he is asking, is the world entering a new Holodomor due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Uh, good question. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that the grain corridor that was uh, that was uh, effectively managed uh, to transport the grains that were held up in the Kherson and the Odessa regions to the through the Odessa port uh, was working, but then again it stopped. As we know that uh, it is through the mediation of Turkey, this kind of a thing is going on. Until the war is on and the aggression continues, it will be difficult to predict. But however, the supply of grains to African countries, especially to Africa, as I know that you know, the talks were held to that effect, uh, is being jeopardized. Now, let me remind you that phenomena like Golodomor did not happen just because of scarcity of grains. Supply and scarcity of grains is one point. The main point is governance, the way we manage this. This is the most important point as Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has written extensively about it that all famine were human made. It is not that, you know, it is how we manage the grains and how we carry it to the user, from the producer to the user. 
and how we maintain our ethos. I do not know other instances other than Yemen right now where we have real famine, real emaciation of children, a terrible humanitarian crisis is going on due to the conflict, the civil war and the intervention by countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran in that part of the world. Africa, of course, also is under threat and the rising food prices will also push people to lower consumption. We might have, if not all of the more, but we might have more malnutrition. This is for certain, but uh, you know, statistics will show. The war needs to end. Ukraine needs to live peacefully. Ukrainian people need to rise up and build their lives. And Russians need to leave the territory of Ukraine. This is the condition that will create a lasting peace. As we know, uh, you know, this has been the sine qua non of everything. Right, Dr. Ghosh, thank you. Uh, another one from uh, Amit Thorat. And this is for any of uh, the panelists, uh, you know, whoever uh, uh, wants to can take this. Uh, what do you think about India's stand on the war and what should be India's ideal position? Any of the can panelists? I answer? Can I yeah, answer that? Yeah, please, please. Um, okay. Uh, this is um, responding to this war um, marks an essential point in India's own destiny as uh, a voice on the global arena. Um, if India is aspiring to being a global leader or at least a global actor, um, it can't possibly take a stance that is uh, strategic insofar only as it takes narrow, immediate pecuniary interests, which are understandable. So for the practical position, let's get oil on the cheap and let's not concern ourselves with ideals, values, principles, or the international global order that was mentioned earlier, which is being decided in this war. Will we carry on with the age of empires? Will those with more weapons, with uh, a bigger military budget be able to invade other countries or will the order of national states um, that was starting to be set up after the second world war and now is the point where the final um, moments of the empire are being um, challenged and empire as as guiding political principles being challenged is that something that um uh, that India's strategy being driven by, or is it being driven by by internal parochial, um, understandable principles? If you are, if if it is a stance that only takes its own immediate pecuniary interests in mind, there's absolutely no way in which a country like that can be seen as a as a global actor, much less a political leader. So, if India wants to have a stance, it needs to have a stance. It can't continue sitting on the fence. The same is true. This is a moment of opportunity for post-colonial nations to, to actually have a say in um, matters that go beyond their own particular interests. Now, it's fine, I think, for any of those nations to say, we actually stand with Russia. We stand with brute force. We stand with authoritarianism. We stand with empire. That is a stance as well. And that is a global stance. That is a global message. Um, but it, it but it has to be said, sitting on the fence keeps countries uh, locked inside their parochial um, uh, positions and prevents them from becoming global actors. And if India doesn't actually um, um, take up a strategic position in this situation, it will remain um, a global non-entity. Right. Uh, Dr. Piliaski, the, the, here's another spicy one for you. Yes. Should de-westernization be a part of Ukraine's decolonial trajectory? De-westernization? Yeah, de-westernization. Should de-westernization be a part of Ukraine's decolonial trajectory? Very, uh, very briefly, uh, Ukraine isn't very westernized at all. Um, people are only starting to learn English. People have only just started going to Europe, visiting, and so on. Um, in many ways, it's a very traditional, um, very family-oriented society. Um, it's um, It would be very hard to de-Westernize a country that is so, in many ways, unwestern. Um, democracy isn't also uh, uh, an exclusive um, 
product of the West, we might remember. The biggest democracy in this world is Eastern um, and um, India, and uh, it has all flavors and shapes and all kinds of cultural orientations. And um, Ukrainian is, is a real sort of mix in East and West and is in many ways very East. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pilyavsky. Uh, and another open question to any of the panel panelists. Uh, as we know, Russia has aided India in the past and has great soft power over Indians and Indian policies. What can Ukraine do to develop their soft power over Russia? Can I take it up? Oh, sorry. Uh, I think that was a mistake. Over India. Sorry. Can I take it up? Yeah. Yes, uh, the point is that, you know, uh, I would like to a little bit continue with the previous question, uh, which was that, you know, what should uh, India do, India's foreign policy? We remember it, it is a non-aligned country. You know, we profess non-alignment. So non-alignment in this case might look like sitting on the fence, which had been before. Uh, this is a complex world and the buying of oil will be there. And it is not just, you know, the powers that are doing something in the West and India is in other side, this kind of a dichotomy. Uh, Indian's position has changed since February, 2022. Before India's position was like from 2014 to 22, it was much softer. So we must remember that it is changing. So I do believe that it might change. Otherwise I agree with my co-panelist Anastasia, whatever she said that a position needs to be articulated. Also the westernization. I think there is nothing wrong with westernization. India is a very westernized place. You know, it's a, what do you mean by westernization? This question is something very strange to me in a globalized world. We are mixing with values, you know, our cultures. It will be, you will see many Ukrainization of Europe. You know, you hear many people learning Ukrainian in Europe. People are knowing more about Ukraine, and uh, I do believe that. The, the question that you had uh, pointed out now is <clears throat> soft power. Ukraine has enormous reserves of soft power, the same like Russia has, but Ukraine ha is a resource constrained country. What we need to do is to have such events like this, you know, what we have like, you know, to learn about, learn from the very beginning, start with the language. I don't know a single individual knowing Ukrainian in India. I do not know a single faculty reading original texts in Ukrainian and trying to understand Ukraine. I mean, this is really not a very good picture. So Indians need to come up to learn and discover Ukraine. There are many people in Ukraine knowing Sanskrit, knowing Hindi. They are doing translations. They are extremely well versed about, you know, Indologists. But we don't have a single university even trying to do a small little bit of their work. You know, what kind of a scholarship are we trying to say? They all repeat the Russian narratives, and this is really shameful. And so Ukraine can do its bit, but you know, Ukraine opened its doors long ago. India needs to open up to Ukraine. Right, Dr. Hensman. You wanted to say something, yeah, Dr. Hensman. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I just wanted to add that, um, yes, as a consequence of what uh, Dr. Ghosh was saying, there's a huge amount of ignorance in India about Ukraine. I mean, when the war started, one of my first responses was to just write a, a historical background to what was happening in Ukraine. And the feedback I got was from a lot of people was, oh, we've never seen it like this. We've never thought of Ukraine as a, a former colony. You know, that we have so much in common with Ukraine is something that a lot of Indians don't know. And I think um, so this kind of program is a really good, uh, is a good development in order to reach out to people and in a sense, educate them about you, you, what is Ukraine. And okay, I don't know Ukrainian, but there are still enough sources in English, which I could 
uh, get to, to understand uh, what was happening, why it was happening, and why we had to support Ukraine in its struggle for freedom with dignity. Um, so I think combating this ignorance, so a lot of people, they don't know what's going on, they, they sort of tune out, or they go along with the, you know, with the mainstream, whatever it's saying. Uh, but this is important, I think, that people should be enlightened about Ukraine. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hensman. Uh, another one from Alexander Switch, uh, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, for, forgive me if I'm not. Uh, so, so, okay. So the question was actually about uh, Russian propaganda in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, the, the explosion of Russian propaganda, uh, you know, over the last few years, uh, so how can that be combated within Ukraine, uh, aside from just uh, blocking such propaganda? Um, can I comment on this? It's not yeah. only Ukraine that Russia propaganda reaches. Um, a, a huge swathe of um, intelligentsia across Euro America um, has been repeating propaganda messages that have been um, pervade uh, via RT, for instance. I think the best way to... Um, um, to counter this is, is by engaging directly, engaging with its logic, talking to people, just as we're doing now, just as I think Rohini Hensman uh, has done exempt in a very exemplary way today, engaging directly with the narratives and engaging in a, in a genuine open discussion where those things are taken seriously um, as uh, logical, um, as, as having a logic of their own and engaging with that logic to um, to show a different side. In the end, people will decide for themselves. Um, and it's certainly, you know, this propaganda doesn't confine itself to Ukraine. Right. Uh, one of the questions that came in uh, while, uh, while the registration for this uh, program was happening, uh, dictatorship of Russia, what it is in reality and what it is in reality and what has motivated the Ukrainians to die and reject this dictatorship of Russia. If mm -hmm. any of the panelists can take that one. Well, uh, well, if you uh, may, I think my my uh, my friend panelists can add. Uh, this is something that the Ukrainians are born with. Uh, being in Ukraine for many years, I've noted that this is a nation of freedom-loving people. First of all, let me tell you again to tell the, uh, the facts is that Russia was a controlled country all the time, even during the Tsarist Russia. Ukraine the, was as a periphery. This was the land of free Cossacks, of more free people who were residing a little bit away from the center. And uh, if Russian nobility, it was called the boyare. They were not having ownership rights. The czar could take away their possessions and make them penniless if he, if he so wanted. But you know, here, the property, the private property, the private freedom, these things were valued more because it also was part of the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth for many years. And Ukraine had, it was a very different uh, place. This had this uh, Magdeburg law in the city. So it had the uh, self-governing organizations at the grassroots levels. So this has a different polity. This polity, when it was joined with Russia, it was russified from the top down, but the real, real urge for freedom never died. It never died. And in starting from the nonviolent movement of the dissidents in 1953 that started in the Arctic Circle of Norilsk, it was led by an Ukrainian. The largest number of dissidents in prison were the Ukrainians. And so you find it all across history. You find in 2004, when the elections were forged, then people came to the streets. Even today, if there is something people don't like, they openly criticize the government even during war times. 
So this is a very different place. So this is a place I think uh, dictatorship will not work. Look at the past 20 years. The precedents had been changed every time there had been elections. Contrarily, in Belarus and Russia, we do not have any change. So I would stop there and maybe my colleagues can take up. Just to add from uh, my personal experience of having been born in the USSR and having transitioned into a very new country, I would say that um, in 1991, in the 90s, there was very little difference between us and the Russians that could be seen. But uh, the, ex the political experience under which every young Russian has now lived, and most Russians can now remember, um, hasn't uh, given Russians a flavor of democracy or political um, authorship uh, and the expression of their own political will, a sense that one can actually have any effect on one's own political destiny, which Ukrainians have now experienced for 30 years directly. And it's a very precious experience. And many people um, don't, when I talk to them about this, how important that freedom is to Ukrainians. They actually talk about before the invasion. Uh, they talk about it. Um, having visited Russia, they talk about how people are afraid to look at each other, how people are afraid to say anything, and how horrible that is. And people say to me, that's that's propaganda, that's Ukrainian propaganda. If people can't really care about freedom, you know, in an everyday daily life, they do, because they still have a memory of unfreedom that was very recent. And they had a taste, one after another colorful revolution, one after another change that they have actually enacted, um, which shows them that they, their own will has an effect on the way that their futures will proceed. And that is absolutely important. And Russians simply don't have that experience. They don't have it. Uh, they have, you know, history has been such, including, of course, the long durée history that Mirdullah has just mentioned. Um, of, of real dif deep differences in political orders in the community. Right. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pilyavsky. One, I think this will uh, this will be the last uh, online question that we'll take. Uh, this is from Nirjhar Mukherjee. Uh, he says, I would like to state that it is very unfortunate that Russian propaganda and fake news have fertile ground in India because of the cultural hegemony by a large section of leftists in India. Any kind of anti-Western activity seems to be worthy of support for these people. This cultural hegemony needs to be challenged. How can we challenge this? Uh, Dr. Hensman, perhaps you could take this up. Yes, um, yes, this is something I have noticed as well. And, um, and it, it grieves me terribly because I am from the left. And it's, uh, I feel terrible that some section of the left is taking completely the wrong side in this. Uh, and how to explain it, I think it's partly because um, that sec this section of the left has really, um, has not understood the importance of democracy for socialism. Somehow it has, because of the Cold War, I suppose, and all the, the the Cold War rhetoric, it has come to see democracy as something opposed to socialism. So they see themselves as socialists and therefore they reject, reject democracy. Uh, whereas if you go back to the beginning, you know, to Marx and Engels, uh, they very much saw democracy as a precondition of socialism, that you could not move forward to socialism without democracy. And so we have to establish democracy, apart from, of course, very basic human rights um, that, uh, you know, going around raping and torturing and killing is absolutely not. I mean, so I think we, this, these are two things we have to do. One is to combat this whole idea uh, that Stalin's Russia was in any way socialist. It was not, and it was not communist. And that is, uh, that's a big task, because if you follow that, then it's okay. It's okay to dominate people. It's okay to send them off to the gulag. It's okay to kill them. It's okay to torture them, uh, carry out genocide, as in the case of partly in Ukraine, especially in Crimea and other, other minorities. Uh, but if it is not 
I mean, if you see that as not socialism, you have to rethink all that. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, okay, Lenin was in some ways ambiguous. I think he did some things which prepared the way for Stalin. Um, I mean, he didn't allow the Constituent Assembly to go ahead. I think he should have done, um, et cetera. I mean, there was some crushing of, or stifling, let's say, stifling of the opposition during his time, which allowed people like Stalin to get much more power. Uh, and then after Lenin's death, you know, to completely, he decimated the Bolsheviks, basically. He wiped them out. That, is, that also needs to be understood. That, and today it should be obvious to everyone that Putin has no, his, has no interest in continuing the legacy of Lenin. He openly, he openly curses Lenin and the Bolsheviks. So I don't see why um, how, how, that, it's, uh, uh, that the left, I can definitely see why the right wing should support Putin. It is completely inconsistent for anyone on the left to do so and then call themselves on the left. I mean, the other thing, of course, is this sort of ambiguous stand. Um, you know, neither one nor the other. We, we, we uh, disapprove of the invasion, but on the other hand, we are against NATO. Okay, I'm against NATO as well. And every time NATO has attacked a country, I've come out in demonstrations against it. That's fine. That's fine. But you can count to more than one. Why have only one enemy? You can have more than one enemy, right? After one comes two, and you can even have three. You can have more than one enemy, and you have to fight all of them. That makes life complicated for us. It's true. But I think we have to do it. It is complicated. Life is like that. We can't just say, this is our one enemy and we will support everyone who is against that enemy. No, we can't because the one who is against that enemy may be also our enemy. So this thing of, you know, the enemy of the enemy is my friend, it's not true. We have to get rid of that kind of thing. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Hensman. Uh, we have received a question from the audience, and I think that that will be the last one uh, for today. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Priya. Uh, what do you think about this war between Ukraine and Russia? Uh, we know powerful countries like America, Japan, and many others. Uh, you know, they they can stop this war for humanity. Because we know what happened in our history, World War One, World War Two. So, what do, should we be ready for World War Three? I think. Uh, I I I, uh, I think uh, this is uh, well. I hope not. Uh, we we don't need. Yeah. To, yeah. But yeah. Any of the panelists like? Yeah. You know, may, your... may I uh, may I talk about it a little bit? Yeah. Uh, yes, this is happening. Firstly, I believe that Stalin's cooperation with Hitler started the Second World War. Poland was attacked from both sides. There was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which everyone conveniently forgets, because then that Stalin later joined the Allied forces. And this indulgence given to Stalin, and there were no Nuremberg for all the atrocities committed by Stalin on the territories of the former Soviet Union, the Holodomor, everything, nothing was done. And if you have these kinds of atrocities, you know, just, you know, endorsed and indulgences are given, it is repeated. It took some hundred years to repeat it now, almost close to hundred years, because a regime like Putin's regime will never come into being if we had the real penal punishments for this humanity, the, the gross humanitarian catastrophe and the human rights violations that took place. So this is, the, this is the point. This got repeated today because we did not look at the other side. We only talked about Nuremberg Nazism. We did not see the other side, the totalitarianism. And we did not talk about the decolonization of the Russian empire, which was in disguise re, re, uh, remodeled within the Soviet Union. 
Right. So this this is the core of the problem. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh. I think uh, we'll wrap it up with that. Uh, thank you so much to all our panelists, our partners, NISC, uh, Kathmandu, uh, the Center for uh, the, uh, the Center for Policy Alternatives, Sri Lanka, the Rainbow Institute of Communication, Sri Lanka, and all the online participants who joined us, uh, you know, from various parts of the world. Uh, I, also, the audience here for you know being so patient with us for you know waiting for. Uh, the end of the program, uh, saying till the end of the program. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I know, uh, you know, this, uh, we, we are all here because we support uh, Ukraine. Our heart bleeds for Ukraine because ex uh, what is happening in Ukraine is a huge, huge tragedy. It's, it's a genocide which is happening right under our noses. Uh, we cannot stay silent. We should not stay silent. I mean, if the world does not choose sides now, it will pay for it uh, many fold, many fold down the line. So uh, I, I, I uh, thank you all once again for joining this program. We hope to have many more such roundtables in future, uh, you know, which can connect, uh, you know, uh, like-minded people to Ukraine and, you know, Ukrainians to, uh, you know, uh, Indians and also our uh, neighbors in uh, South Asia. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a very good evening. Thank you. And I would like to request all of you to join us outside for some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.